Chapter Twenty of Flemington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter Twenty: The Parting of the Ways. July spread a mantle of heather over the Grampians. In Glen Esk, the rough road into the lowlands little better than a sheep track, ran down the shore of Loch Lee to come out at last into the large spaces at the foot of the hills. The grayness of the summer haze lay over everything, and the short grass and the roots of bog myrtle and thyme smelt warm and heady, for the wind was still. The sun seemed to have sucked up some of the heather color out of the earth, the lower atmosphere was suffused with a dusty lilac, where, high overhead, it softened the contours of the scattered rocks. Amongst carpets of rush and deep moss, dappled with wet patches, the ruddy stems of the bog asphodel raised slim golden heads that drooped a little, as though for faintness in the scented warmth. An occasional bumblebee passed downwind, purposeful and ostentatious, like a respectable citizen zealous on the business of life. No one looking along the windings of the glen and drawing in the ardent quietness of the summer warmth would have supposed that fire and sword had been through it so lately. Its vastness of outline hid the ruined huts and black fragments of skeleton gable ends that had smoked up into the mountain stillness. Homeless women and children had fled down its secret tracks. Hunted men had given up their souls under its heights. The rich plain land of Angus had sent its sons to fight for the prince in the north, and of those who survived to make their way back to their homes, many had been overtaken by the pursuit that had swept down behind them through the hills. No place had a darker record than Glen Esk. Archie Flemington rode down the glen with his companion some little way in front of the corporal and the three men who followed them. His left arm was in a sling, for he had received a sabre cut at Culloden. Also he had been rolled on by his horse, which was killed under him, and had broken a rib. His wound, though not serious, had taken a long time to heal, for the steel had cut into the arm bone. He looked thin, too, for the winter had been a time of strenuous work. One of the three private soldiers, the last of the small string of horsemen, had a rope knotted into his reins, the other end of which was secured round the middle of a short, thick-set man who paced sullenly along beside the horse. The prisoner's arms were bound at his back. His reddish beard was unkempt, and his clothes ragged. He made a sorry figure in the surrounding beauty. Nearly two months had gone by since the Battle of Culloden, and the search for fugitives was still going on in remote places. Cumberland, who was on the point of leaving Fort Augustus for Edinburgh on his way to London, had given orders for a last scouring of Glen Esk. The party had almost reached its mouth, and its efforts had resulted only in the capture of this one rebel but, as there was some slight doubt of his identity, and as the officer who rode beside Archie was one whose conscience ranked a great way above his convenience, the red-bearded man had fared better than many of those taken by Cumberland's man-hunters. If he were the person they supposed him to be, he was an Angus farmer distantly related to David Ferrier, and he was now being brought to his own country for identification. Captain Callender, the officer in command was a long, lean, bony man with a dark face, a silent, hard-bitten fellow from Ligonier's regiment. He and Archie had met very little before they started south together, and they had scarcely progressed in acquaintance in the few days during which they had ridden side by side. They had shared their food on the bare turf by day, lain down within a few yards of each other at night. They had gone through many of the same experiences in the north, and they belonged to the same victorious army, yet they knew little more of each other than when they started. But there was no dislike between them, 
certainly not on Archie's side, and if the other was a little critical of the foreign role of his companion's R's, he did not show it. Archie's tongue had been quiet enough. He was riding listlessly along, and though he looked from side to side, taking in the details of what he saw from force of habit, they seemed to give him no interest. He puzzled Callender a good deal, for he had proved to be totally different from anything that he had expected. The soldier was apt to study his fellow men when not entirely swallowed up by his duty, and he had been rather pleased when he found that Cumberland's brilliant intelligence officer was to accompany him down Glen Esk. He had heard much about him. Archie's quick answers and racy talk had amused the Duke, who, uncompanionable himself, felt the awkward man's amazement at the readiness of others, and scraps of Flemington's sayings had gone from lip to lip, hallmarked by his approval. Callender was taciturn and grave, but he was not stupid, and he had begun to wonder what was amiss with his companion. He decided that his own society must be uncongenial to him, and being a very modest man, he did not marvel at it. But the sources of Archie's discomfort lay far, far deeper than any passing irritation. It seemed to him now, as he reached the mouth of the glen, that there was nothing left in life to fear, because the worst that could come upon him was looming ahead, waiting for him, counting his horse's steps as he left the hills behind. An apprehension, a mere suggestion of what might be remotely possible, a skeleton that had shown its face to him in sleepless or overwrought moments since Cumberland's victory, had become real. To most people who are haunted by a particular dread, fate plays one of the tricks she loves so much. She is an expert boxer, and whilst each man stands up to her in his long defensive fight, his eye upon hers, guarding himself from the blow he expects to receive in the face, she hits him in the wind and he finds himself knocked out. But she had dealt otherwise with Archie, for a week ago he had been specially detailed to proceed to Angus to hunt for that important rebel, Captain James Logie, who was believed to have made his way southward to his native parts. At Fort Augustus it was felt that Flemington was exactly the right man to be entrusted with the business. He was familiar with the country he had to search. He was a man of infinite resource and infinite intelligence, and Cumberland meant to be pleasant in his harsh, ungraceful manner when he gave him his commission in person, with a hint that he expected more from Mr. Flemington than he did from anybody else. He was to accompany Captain Callender and his three men. The officer, having made a last sweep of Glen Esk, was to go on by Brecon to Forfar, where he would be joined by another and larger party of troops that was on its way down Glen Clova from Braemar, for Cumberland was drafting small forces into Angus by way of the Grampians, and the country was filling with them. He had dealt drastically with Montrose. The rebellion in the town had been suppressed, and the neighborhood put under military law. This bit of the east coast had played a part that was not forgotten by the little German general, and he was determined that the hornet's nest he had smoked out should not recollect. Whilst James Logie was at large, there could be no security. Of all the rebels in Scotland, Logie was the man whom Cumberland was most desirous to get. The great nobles who had taken part in the rising were large quarry indeed, but this commoner, who had worked so quietly in the eastern end of Angus, who had been on the prince's staff, who had the experience of many campaigns at his back, whose ally was the notorious farrier, who had seized the harbour of Montrose under the very guns of a government sloop of war, was as dangerous as any highland chieftain, and the news that he had been allowed to get back to his own haunts made the Whig generals curse. Though he might be quiet for the moment, he would be ready to stir up the same mischief on the first recrudescence of Stuart energy. It was not known what had happened to Ferrier, for although he was a marked man and would be a rich haul for anybody who could deliver him up to Cumberland, he was considered a less important influence than James. 
and government had scarcely estimated his valuable services to the Jacobites, which were every whit as great as those of his friend. Lord Balnillo was a puzzle to the intelligence department. His name had gone into headquarters as that of a strongly suspected rebel. He was James's brother, yet, while Archie had included him in the report he had entrusted to the beggar, he had been able to say little that was definite about him. The very definite information he had given about James and Ferrier, the details of his pursuit of the two men and his warning of the attack on the venture, had mattered more to the authorities than the politics of the peaceable old judge, and Balnillo's subsequent conduct had been so little in accordance with that of his brother that he was felt to be a source of small danger. He had been no great power on the bench where his character was so easy that prisoners were known to think themselves lucky in appearing before him. No one could quite account for his success in the law, and the mention of his name in the legal circles of Edinburgh raised nothing worse than a smile. He had taken no part in the rejoicing that followed James's feat at Montrose, but had taken the opportunity of leaving the neighborhood, and during his long stay in Edinburgh he had frequented Whig houses and had been the satellite of a conspicuous Whig lady, one who had been received by Cumberland with some distinction, the grandmother of the man who had denounced Logie. The authorities decided to leave him alone. When the hills were behind the riders and the levels of the country had sunk and widened out on either hand, they crossed the North Esk, which made a shallow curve by the village of Edsel. The bank rose on its western side, and the shade of the trees was delightful to the travellers, and particularly to the prisoner they carried with them. As the horses snuffed at the water, they could hardly be urged through it, and Callender and Archie dismounted on the farther shore, and sat on a boulder whilst they drank. They watched them as they drew the draught up their long throats, and raised their heads when satisfied to stare with dripping muzzles at distant nothings after the fashion of their kind. The prisoner's aching arms were unbound that he might drink, too. "'Egad, I have pitied that poor devil these last miles,' said Archie, as the man knelt at the brink and extended his stiffened arms into a pool. The other nodded. Theoretically he pitied him, but a rebel was a rebel. "'You have no bowels of compassion.' They are not in your instructions, Callender. They should be served out like ammunition. Callender turned his grave eyes on him. The idea displeases you, said Archie. It would complicate our duty. He spoke like a humorless man, but one side of his mouth twitched downwards a little, and Flemington, who had the eye of a lynx for another man's face, decided that the mere accident of habit had prevented it from twitching up. He struck him as the most repressed person he had ever seen. "'There would not be enough at headquarters to go round,' observed Archie. Callender's mouth straightened, and, like the horses, he looked at nothing. Criticism was another thing not in his instructions. "'They have drunk well,' he said at last. "'An hour will bring us to the foot of Huntley Hill. We can halt and feed them at the top before we turn off towards Brecon.' You know this country better than I do. Wait a little, said Archie. I'm no rebel, and you may have mercy on me with a clear conscience. He had slipped his arm out of the sling and was resting it on his knee. You are in pain, exclaimed Callender, astonished. Archie laughed. Why, man, do you think I ride for pleasure with the top half of a bone working east and the bottom half working west? I thought, began Callender, you thought me churlish company, and maybe I have been so, but this ride has been no holiday for me. I did not mean that. I would have said that I thought your wound was mended. My flesh wound is mended, and so is my rib, said Flemington, but there are two handsome splinters hobnobbing above my elbow, and I can tell you that they dance to the tune of my horse's jog. Callender's opinion of him rose. He had found him disappointing as a companion, but Archie had hid his pain, and he understood people who did that. The Edzel villagers turned out to stare at them as they passed a short time later, when they took the road again. 
After the riders left its row of houses, their way ran from the river level through fields that had begun to oust the moor, rising to the crest of Huntley Hill, on the farther side of which the southern part of Angus spread its partial cultivation down to the basin of Montrose. Archie's discomfort seemed to grow. He shifted his sling again and again, and Callander could see his mouth set in a hard line. Now and then an impatient sound of pain broke from him. They rode on, silent, the long rise of the hill barring their road like a wall, and the stems of the fir strip that crowned it beginning to turn to a dusky black against the sky, which was cooling off for evening. Flemington's horse was a slow walker, and he had begun to jog persistently. His rider, holding him back, had fallen behind. Callender rode on, preoccupied, and when, roused from his thoughts, he turned his head, Archie waved him on, shouting that he would follow more slowly, for the troopers moved at a foot's pace because of their prisoner, and he stayed abreast of them. As Callender passed a green sea of invading bracken that had struggled on to the road, his jaw dropped and he pulled up. Behind the feathering waves an individual was sitting in a wooden box on wheels, and four dogs, harnessed to the rude vehicle, were lying on the ground in their leathern traces. He noticed with astonishment that the man had lost the lower parts of his legs. "'You'll be Captain Callender," said Waddy, his twinkling eyes on the other's uniform. "'You're terrible late.' "'What do you want?' said the officer, amazed." The beggar peered through the fern and saw the knot of riders and their prisoner coming along the road some little way behind. "'Where's yon lad Flemington?' he demanded. "'What do you want?' exclaimed Callender again. "'If you are a beggar, you have chosen a strange place to beg in.' For answer, Watty pulled up his sliding panel and took out two sealed letters, holding them low in the shelter of the fern as if the midges, dancing their evening dance above the bracken tops, should not look upon them. Callender saw that one of the letters bore his own name. Wished, said the beggar, thrusting them back quickly. Come doon here and hae a crack with me. As Callender had been concerned exclusively with troops and fighting, he knew little about the channels of information working in the country, and it took him a moment to explain the situation to himself. He dismounted under the fixed glare of the yellow dog. He was a man to whom small obstacles were invisible when he had a purpose, and he almost trod on the animal without noticing the suppressed hostility gathering about his heels. But so long as his master's voice was friendly, the cur was still, for his unwavering mind answered to its every tone. Probably no spot in all Angus contained two such steadfast living creatures as did this green place by the bracken when Callender and the yellow dog stood side by side. The soldier tethered his horse and sat down on the moss. Watty laid the letters before him. The second was addressed to Archie. Callender broke the seal of the first and read it slowly through. Then he sat silent, examining the signature which was the same that Flemington had showed to the beggar on the day when he met him for the first time, months ago, by the mill of Balnillo. He was directed to advance no farther towards Brecon, but to keep himself out of sight among the woods round Huntley Hill, and to watch the Muir of Pert, for it was known that the rebel, James Logie, was concealed somewhere between Brecon and the river. He was not upon the Balnillo estate, which, with Balnillo House, had been searched from end to end, but he was believed to be in the neighbourhood of the Muir. "'You know the contents of this?' asked Callender, as he put away the paper inside the breast of his coat. "'Dad, a can it'll be about Logie. He's a fell man, yon. Have ye not got Flemington wit ye?' Callender looked upon his companion with disapproval. He had never seen him, never heard of him before, and he felt his manner and his way of speaking of his superiors to be an outrage upon discipline and order, which were two things very near to his heart. He did not reply. "'Where's Flemington?' demanded the beggar again. 
You make very free with Mr. Flemington's name. Tuts! exclaimed Waddy, ignoring the rebuke. I've got my orders the same as yourself, and I'm to gay yon thing to him and to nigh either body. Who will a day that if a dinner ken where he is? His argument was indisputable. Mr. Flemington will be with me in a moment, said Callender stiffly. He is following. The sound of horses' feet was nearing them upon the road, and Callender rose and beckoned to Archie to come on. "'Go to the top of the hill and halt until I join you,' he told the corporal as the men passed. As Archie dismounted and saw who was behind the bracken, he recoiled. It was to him as if all that he most loathed in the past came to meet him in the beggar's face. Here, at the confines of the lowland country, the same hateful influences were waiting to engulf him. His soul was weary within him. He barely replied to Waddy's familiar greeting. "'Do you know this person?' inquired Callender. He assented. "'Aye, does he. Him and me's weel acquaint,' said Waddy, closing an eye. "'Hi, take yon.' He held out the letter to Flemington. The young man opened it slowly, turning his back to the cart, and his brows drew together as he read. His destiny did not mean him to escape. Logie had been marked down, and the circle of his enemies was narrowing round him. Flemington was to go no farther, and he was to remain with Callender to await another message that would be brought to their bivouac on Huntley Hill before approaching nearer to Brecon. He stood aside, the paper in his hand. Here was the turning point. He was face to face with it at last. He could not take part in Logie's capture. On that he was completely, unalterably determined. What would be the end of it all for himself he could not think. Nothing was clear, nothing plain, but the settled strength of his determination. He looked into the mellowing light round him and saw everything as though it were unreal. The only reality was that he had chosen his way. Heaven was pitiless, but it should not shake him. Far above him a solitary bird was winging its way into the spaces beyond the hills, the measured beat of its wings growing invisible as it grew smaller and smaller and was finally lost to sight. He watched it, fascinated, with the strange detachment of those whose senses and consciousness are numbed by some crisis. What was it carrying away, that tiny thing that was being swallowed by the vastness? His mind could only grasp the idea of distance, of space. Callender was at his elbow, and his voice broke on him as the voice of someone awakening him from sleep. "'These are my orders,' he was saying, as he held out his own letter. "'You know them, for I am informed here that they are the duplicate of yours.' There was no escape. Callender knew the exact contents of both papers. Archie might have kept his own orders to himself and have given him to suppose that he was summoned to Forfar or Perth and must leave him. But that was impossible. He must either join in hunting Logie, or leave the party on this side of Huntley Hill. "'We had better get on,' said Callender. They mounted, and as they did so, Watty also got under way. His team was now reduced to four, for the terrier which had formerly run alone in the lead had died about the new year. He took up his switch, and the yellow cur and his companions whirled him with a mighty tug onto the road. He had been waiting for some time in the bracken for the expected horsemen, and as the dogs had enjoyed a long rest, they followed the horses at a steady trot. Callender and Flemington trotted, too, and the cart soon fell behind. Beyond the crest of Huntley Hill, the Muir of Pert sloped eastwards towards the coast, its edges resting upon the Esk, but before the road began to ascend it forked in two, one part running upwards and the other breaking away west towards Brecon. "'Callender, I'm going to leave you,' said Archie, pulling up his horse. "'To leave!' exclaimed the other blankly. "'In God's name, where are you going?' "'Here is the shortest way to Brecon, and I shall take it. I must find a surgeon to attend to this arm. 
There is no use for me to go on with you, and I can hardly sit in my saddle for pain. But your orders, gasped Callender. I will make that right. You must go on alone. Probably I shall join you in a few days, but that will depend on what instructions I get later. If you hear nothing from me, you will understand that I am busy out of sight. My hands may be full, that is, if the surgeon leaves me with both of them. Good-bye, Callender. He turned his horse and left him. The other opened his mouth to shout after him, ordering him to come back, but remembered that he had no authority to do so. Flemington was independent of him. He belonged to a different branch of the King's service, and although he had fought at Culloden, he was under different orders. He had merely accompanied his party, and Callender knew very well that, though he his junior in years, he was a much more important person than himself. The nature of Archie's duties demanded that he should be given a free hand in his movements, and no doubt he knew what he was about. But had he been Callender's subordinate, and had there been a surgeon round the nearest corner, his arm might have dropped from his shoulder before the officer would have permitted him to fall out of the little troop. Callender had never in all his service seen a man receive definite orders, only to disobey them openly. He watched him go, petrified. His brain was a good one, but it worked slowly, and Archie's decision and departure had been as sudden as a thunderbolt. Also there was contempt in his heart for his softness, and he was sorry. Archie turned round and saw him, still looking after him. He sent back a jibe to him. "'If you don't go on, I will report you for neglect of duty,' he shouted, laughing. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 of Flemington This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter 21. Huntley Hill. Callender rode up Huntley Hill, the rose-red of the blossoming briar that decks all Angus with its rubies, glowed in the failing sunlight, and the scent of its leaf came in puffs from the wayside ditches. The blurred heads of the meadow sweet were being turned into clouds of gold as the sun grew lower and the road climbed higher. In front the trees began to mantle Huntley Hill. He had just begun the ascent at a foot's pace when he heard the whir of the beggar's chariot wheels behind him, then at his side and he turned in his saddle and looked down on his pursuer's bald crown. Wattie had cast off his bonnet, and the light breeze springing up lifted the fringe of his grizzled hair. "'Where a was Flemington?' he cried as he came up. The other answered by another question. His thoughts had come back to the red-haired prisoner at the top of the hill, and it struck him that the man in the cart might recognize him. "'What's your name?' he asked abruptly. What he cared. You belong to these parts? He nodded. Then come on, I have not done with you yet. I'm asking you where's Flemington. If Callender had pleased himself, he would have driven Waddy down the hill at the point of the sword. His persistence and his pestilent, unashamed curiosity were so distasteful to him. But he had a second use for him now. He was that uncommon thing, a disciplinarian with tact, and by virtue of the combination in himself, he understood that the troopers in front of him, who had been looking forward eagerly to getting their heads once more under a roof that night, would be disgusted by the orders he was bringing. He had noticed the chanter sticking out from under Wattie's leathern bag, and he thought that a stirring tune or two might ease matters for them. He did not see his way to dispensing with him at present, so he tolerated his company. "'Mr. Flemington has a bad wound,' he answered. "'He has gone to Brecon to have it attended to. "'Where did he get it?' "'At Culloden Moor. "'They didn't tell me anything about that. "'Who tells you anything about Mr. Flemington? "'What do you know about him?' exclaimed Wattie with contempt. "'It's myself that should tell them, 
I ken mair aboot Flemington than any other body. I ken fine what's brocked yon lad there. He's seeking Logie like anybody else, and but he kens fine he'll not get him. Aye, does he. Callender looked down from his tall horse upon the grotesque figure so close to the ground. He was furious at the creature's assumption of knowledge. "'You are a piper?' said he. "'The best in Scotland.' "'Then keep your breath for piping and let other people's business be,' he said sternly. "'Man, din a fash. It's King Gordy's business and sign it's mine. Him and me's Billy's. Aye, he's a wa, is he, Flemington?' Callender quickened his horse's pace. He was not going to endure this offensive talk. But Wattie urged on his dogs, too, and followed hard on his heels. All through the winter, whilst the fortunes of Scotland were deciding themselves in the north, he had been idle but for his piping and singing, and he had had little to do with the higher matters on which he had been engaged in the autumn, whilst the forces of the coming storm were seething south of the Grampians. He had not set eyes on Flemington since their parting by the farm on Rossy Moor, but many a night lying among his dogs he had thought of Archie's voice, calling to Logie as he tossed and babbled in his broken dreams. He had long since drawn his conclusion and made up his mind that he admired Archie as a mighty clever fellow, but he was convinced that he was more astute than anybody supposed and it gave him great delight to think that probably no one but himself had a notion of the part Flemington was playing. Wattie was well aware of his advancement, for his name was in everybody's mouth. He knew that he was on Cumberland's staff, just as Logie was on the staff of the Prince, and he wagged his head as he thought how Archie must have enriched himself at the expense of both Whig and Jacobite. It was his opinion that knowledge being marketable, it was time that somebody else should enrich himself too. He would have given a great deal to know whether Flemington, as a well-known man, had continued his traffic with the other side, and as he went up the hill beside the dark Whig officer, he was turning the question over in his mind. He had kept his suspicions jealously to himself. Whilst Flemington was far away in the north and all men's eyes were looking across the Grampians, he knew that he could command no attention, and he had cursed because he believed his chance of profit to be lost. Archie had gone out of range, and he could not reach him. Yet he kept his knowledge close like a prudent man, in case the time should come when he might use it. And now Flemington had returned, and he had been sent out to meet him. The way had grown steep and as Callender's horse began to stumble, the soldier swung himself off the tired beast and walked beside him, his hand on the mane. Waddy was considering whether he should speak. If his information were believed, it would be specially valuable at this time, when the authorities were agog to catch Logie, and the reward for his services must be considerable if there was any justice in the world. They would never catch Logie, because Flemington was in league with him. Wattie knew what many knew, that the rebel was believed to be somewhere about the great Muir of Pert, now just in front of them. But so far as he could make out, the only person who was aware of how the wind set with Archie was himself. What he had seen at the foot of Huntley Hill had astonished him, till he had read its meaning by the light of his own suspicions though he had not been close enough to the two men to hear exactly what passed between them when they parted, he had seen them part. He had seen Callender standing to look after the other as though uncertain how to act, and he had heard Archie's derisive shout. There was no sign of a quarrel between them, yet Callender's face suggested they had disagreed. There was perplexity in it, an underlying disapproval. He had seen his gesture of astonishment, and the way in which he had sat looking after Flemington at the crossroads, reining back his horse, which would have followed its companion, was eloquent to the beggar. Callender had not expected the young man to go. Waddy did not know the nature of the orders he had brought, but he knew that they referred to Logie. He understood that those who received them were hastening to meet those who had dispatched them, 
who would be with them that night, and this proved to him how important it was that the letters should be in the hand of the riders before they advanced farther on their way. He had been directed to wait on the northern side of Huntley Hill, and had been specially charged to deliver them before Callender crossed it. He told himself that only a fool would fail to guess that they referred to this particular place. But the illuminating part to Waddy was the speech he had heard by the Bracken. It was all that was needed to explain the officer's stormy looks. "'These are my orders,' Callender had said. "'But you know them, for I am informed that they are the duplicate of yours.' Archie had disobeyed them, and Watty was sure that he had gone, because the risk of meeting Logie was too great to be run. Now was the time for him to speak. He had no nicety, but he had shrewdness in plenty. He was sudden and persistent in his address, and divining the obstacles in Callender's mind, he charged them like a bull. "'Flemington'll na let ye get Logie,' said he. He made his announcement with so much emphasis that the man walking beside him was impressed in spite of his prejudices. He was annoyed, too. He turned on him angrily. "'Once and for all, what do you mean by this infernal talk about Mr. Flemington?' he cried, stopping short. "'You will either speak out, or I will take it upon myself to make you. I have three men in the wood up yonder who will be very willing to help me.' I believe you to be a meddlesome liar, and if I find that I am right, you shall smart for it. But the beggar needed no urging, and he was not in the least afraid of Calendar. It's no me that swear to speak, it's yourself that swear to listen, said he, with some truth. Dod, I've telt ye afore, and I'm tellin' ye again. Flemington'll no let ye get him. He's dancin' with George, but he's takin' the tune for Charlie. Huch, dinna tell me. There's money had done the same afore, and I'll die it yet. The officer was standing in the middle of the road, a picture of perplexity. It's no the oxter of him that gars him gang, said Waddy, breaking into the broad smile of one who is successfully letting the light of reason into another's mind. It's no his arm, maybe it gates him a puckly twist, wilds and maybe a dozen, but it's no that that gars the like o' him greet. He wouldn't a come up Huntley Hill with you, for he can't. He was ower near Logie. It's that and nae mare. Callender began to think back. He had not heard one complaint from Archie since the day they rode out of Fort Augustus together, and he remembered his own astonishment at hearing he was in pain from his wound. It seemed only to have become painful in the last couple of hours. It is easy to make accusations, he said grimly, but you will have to prove them. What proof have you? Is it proofs you're needin'? Fegs, I dinna gang a boot with them and my poke. I can tell ye my proof's fine, but maybe you'll no listen. He made as though to drive on. Callender stepped in front of the dogs and stood in his path. You will speak out before I take another step, said he. I will have no shuffling. Come, out with what you know. I will stay here till I get it. End of chapter 21。Chapter 22 of Flemington。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter 22 Huntley Hill continued. Callender sat a little apart from his men on the fringe of the fir wood. On the other side of the clearing, on which the party had bivouacked, Waddy formed the centre of a group. It was past sunset, and the troop horses, having been watered and fed, were picketed together. Callender's own horse snatched at the straggling bramble shoots behind a tree. The officer sat on a log, his chin in his hand, pondering on the amazing story that the beggar had divulged. It was impossible to know what to make of it, but, in spite of himself, he was inclined to believe it. He had questioned and cross-questioned him, but he had been able to form no definite opinion. Waddy had described his meeting with Archie on the day of the taking of the ship. 
He had told him how he had accompanied him on his way, how he had been forced to ask shelter for him at the farm, how he had lain and listened in the darkness to his feverish wanderings and his appeals to Logie. If the beggar's tale had been true, there seemed to be no doubt that the intelligence officer, whose services were so much valued by Cumberland, had taken money from the rebels, though it seemed that he had hesitated over the business. His conscience must have smitten him even in his dreams. "'I will say nothing, but I will tell you all,' he had cried to Logie. "'I shall know where you are, but they shall never know.' In his delirium he had taken the beggar for the man whose fellow-conspirator he was proving himself to be, and when consciousness was fighting to return, and he had sense enough to know that he was not speaking to Logie, it was his companion's promise to deliver a message of reassurance that had given him peace and sleep. "'Tell him that he can trust me,' he had said. What puzzled Callender was the same thing that had puzzled Watty. Why had these two men, linked together by a hidden understanding, fought? Perhaps Flemington had repented of the part he was playing, and had tried to cut himself adrift. "'Let me go!' he had exclaimed. It was all past Callender's comprehension. At one moment he was inclined to look on Watty as an understudy for the father of lies. At another he asked himself how he could have had the courage to invent such a calumny, how he dared to choose a man for his victim who had reached the position that Archie had gained. But he realized that, had Watty been inventing, he would hardly have invented the idea of a fight between Flemington and Captain Logie. That little incongruous touch seemed to Callender's reasonable mind to support the truth of his companion's tongue. And then there was Flemington's sudden departure. It did not look so strange since he had heard what the beggar had to say. He began to think of his own surprise at finding Archie in pain from a wound which seemed to have troubled him little so far, and to suspect that his reliable wits had been stimulated to find a new use for his injured arm by the sight of Huntley Hill, combined with the news in his pocket. His gorge rose at the thought that he had been riding all these days side by side with a very prince among traitors. His face hardened. His own duty was not plain to him, and that perturbed him so much that his habitual outward self-repression gave way. He could not sit still while he was driven by his perplexities. He sprang up, walking up and down between the trees. Ought he to send a man straight off to Brecon with a summary of the beggar's statement? He could not vouch for the truth of his information, and there was every chance of it being disregarded, and himself marked as the discoverer of a mare's nest. There was scarcely anything more repugnant to Callender than the thought of himself in this character, and for that reason, if for no other, he inclined to the risk, for he had the overwhelmingly conscientious man's instinct for martyrdom. His mind was made up. He took out his pocket-book and wrote what he had to say, in the fewest and shortest words. Then he called the corporal, and to his extreme astonishment ordered him to ride to Brecon. When the man had saddled his horse, he gave him the slip of paper. He had no means of sealing it here in the fir wood, but the messenger was a trusted man, one to whom he would have committed anything with absolute conviction. He was sorry that he had to lose him, for he could not tell how long he might be kept on the edge of the muir, nor how much country he would have to search with his tiny force, but there was no help for it, and he trusted that the corporal would be sent back to him before the morrow. He was the only person to whom he could give the open letter. When the soldier had mounted, Callender accompanied him to the confines of the wood, giving him instructions from the map he carried. Waddy sat on the ground beside his cart. His back was against a little raised bank. Where his feet should have been, the yellow dog was stretched asleep. As Callender and his corporal disappeared among the trees, he began to sing the Todd in his rich voice, throwing an atmosphere of dramatic slyness into the words that made his hearers shout with delight at the end of each verse. 
When he had finished the song, he was barely suffered to take breath before being compelled to begin again. Even the prisoner, who lay resting, still bound, within sight of the soldiers, listened, laughing into his red beard. But suddenly he stopped, rising to his feet. A lang-legged devil with his hand upon the gate, and I, the good wife, cries to him. Waddy's voice fell, cutting the line short, for a rush of steps was bursting through the trees, was close on them, dulled by the pine needles underfoot, sweeping over the stumps and the naked roots. The beggar stared, clutching at the bank. His three companions sprang up. The wood rang with shots, and one of the soldiers rolled over on his face, gasping as he tried to rise, struggling and snatching at the ground with convulsed fingers. The remaining two ran, one towards the prisoner and one towards the horses, which were plunging against each other in terror. The latter man dropped midway with a bullet through his head. The swiftness of the undreamed-of misfortune struck panic into Waddy, as he sat alone, helpless, incapable either of flight or of resistance. One of his dogs was caught by the leaden hail and lay fighting its life out a couple of paces from where he was left, a defenseless thing in this sudden storm of death. Two of the remaining three went rushing through the trees, yelping as the stampeding horses added their share to the danger and riot. These had torn up their heel-pegs, which, wrenched easily from a resistance made for the most part of moss and pine-needles, swung and whipped at the ends of the flying ropes behind the crazy animals as they dashed about. The surviving trooper had contrived to catch his own horse, and was riding for his life towards the road by which they had come from Edsel. The only quiet thing besides the beggar was the yellow cur, who stood at his master's side, stiff and stubborn and ugly, the coarse hair rising on his back. Waddy's panic grew as the drumming of hooves increased and the horses dashed hither and thither. He was more afraid of them than of the ragged enemy that had descended on the wood. The dead troopers lay huddled, one on his face and the other on his side. The wounded dog's last struggles had ceased. Half a dozen men were pursuing the horses with outstretched arms, and Callender's charger had broken loose with its comrades, and was thundering this way and that, snorting and leaping with cocked ears and flying mane. The beggar watched them with a horror which his dislike and fear of horses made agonizing, the menace of these irresponsible creatures mad with excitement and terror, so heavy, so colossal, when seen from his own helpless nearness to the earth, that was shaking under their tread, paralyzed him. His impotence enwrapped him, tragic, horrible, a nightmare woven of death's terrors. He could not escape. There was no shelter from the thrashing hooves, the gleaming iron of the shoes. The cumbrous perspective of the great animals blocked out the sky with its bulk as their rocking bodies went by, plunging, slipping, recovering themselves within the cramped circle of the open space. He knew nothing of what was happening, nor did he see that the prisoner stood, freed from his bonds. He knew James Logie by sight, and he knew Ferrier, but, though both were standing by the red-bearded man, he recognized neither. He had just enough wits left to understand that Callender's bivouac had been attacked but he wrecked of nothing but the thundering horses that were being chased to and fro as the circle of men closed in. He felt sick as it narrowed, and he could only flatten himself, stupefied against the bank. The last thing he saw was the yellow coat of his dog, as the beast cowered and snapped, keeping his post with desperate tenacity in the din. The bank against which he crouched cut the clearing diagonally, and as the men pressed in nearer around the horses, Callender's charger broke out of the circle, followed by the two others. A cry from the direction in which they galloped, and the sound of frantic nearing hooves, told that they had been headed back once more. The bank was high enough to hide Waddy from them as they returned, but he could feel the earth shake with their approach, 
which rang in his ears like the roar of some dread implacable fate. He could see nothing now as he lay, half blind with fear, but he was aware that his dog had leaped upon the bank behind him, and he heard the well-known voice, hoarse and brutal with defiant agony, just above his head. All the qualities that have gone to make the dog the outcast of the East seemed to show in the cur's attitude as he raised himself, an insignificant common beast, in the path of the great noble stampeding creatures. It was the curse of his curship that in this moment of his life, when he hurled all that was his in the world, his low-bred body against the danger that swooped on his master, he should take on no nobility of aspect, nothing to picture forth the heart that smote against his panting ribs. Another moment, and the charger had leaped at the bank, just above the spot where Skirling Waddy's grizzled head lay against the sod. The cur sprang up against the overwhelming bulk, the smiting hooves, the whirl of heel ropes, and struck in mid-air by the horse's knee, was sent rolling down the slope. As he fell, there was a thud of dislodged earth, and the charger, startled by the sudden apparition of the prostrate figure below him, slipped on the bank, stumbled, sprang, and, checked by the flying rope, crashed forward, burying the beggar under his weight. James and Ferrier ran forward as the animal struggled to its feet, unhurt. It tore past the men who had broken their line as they watched the fall. The three horses made off between the trees, and Logie approached the beggar. He lay crushed and mangled, as quiet as the dead troopers on the ground. There was no mistaking Waddy's rigid stillness, and as James and Ferrier, with the red-bearded man, approached him, they knew that he would never rise to blow his pipes, nor to fill the air with his voice again. The yellow dog was stretched, panting, a couple of paces from the grotesque body, which had now, for the first time, taken on dignity. As Logie bent to examine him, and would have lifted him, the cur dragged himself up. One of his hind legs was broken, but he crawled, snarling, to the beggar's side, and turned his maimed body to face the men who should dare to lay a hand on Waddy. The drops poured from his hanging tongue, and his eye was alight with a dull flame of pain. He would have torn Logie to bits if he could, as he trailed himself up to shelter the dead man from his touch. He made a great effort to get upon his legs, and his jaws closed within an inch of James's arm. One of the men drew the pistol from his belt. "'I shoot the brute,' said another. James held up his hand. "'The man is dead,' said he, looking over his shoulder at his comrades. "'And you would be the same if yon dog could reach you,' rejoined Ferrier. "'Let me shoot him. He will only die lying here. "'Let him be. His leg is broken, that is all.' The cur made another attempt to get his teeth into Logie, and almost succeeded. Ferrier raised his pistol again, but James thrust it back. "'The world needs a few such creatures as that in it,' said he. "'Lord, Ferrier, what a heart there is in that poor brute! "'Stand away from him, Logie. He is half mad.' "'We must get away from this place,' said James, unheeding, "'or that man who has ridden away will bring the whole country about our ears. "'It has been a narrow escape for you, Gourlay,' he said to the release prisoner." We must leave the old vagabond lying where he is. There is no burying him with that devil left alive, cried Ferrier. I promise you I will not venture to touch him. My poor fellow, said James, turning to the dog, it is of no use. You cannot save him. God help you for the truest friend that a man ever had. He pulled off his coat and approached him. The men stood round, looking on in amazement, as he flung it over the yellow body. The dog yelled as Logie grasped and lifted him, holding him fast in his arms, but his jaws were muffled in the coat and the pain of the broken limb was weakening his struggles. Ferrier looked on with his hands on his hips. He admired the dog, but did not always understand James. "'You are going to hamper yourself with him now?' he exclaimed. 
"'Give me the piper's bonnet,' said the other. "'There. "'Push it into the crook of my arm between the poor brute and me. "'It will make him go the easier. "'You will need to scatter now. "'Leave the piper where he is. "'A few inches of earth will do him no good. "'Farrier, I'm going. "'You and I will have to lie low for a while after this.' The cur had grown exhausted and ceased to fight. He shivered and snuffled feebly at the Kilmarnock bonnet, the knob of which made a red spot against the shirt on James's broad breast. Ferrier and Gourlay glanced after him as he went off between the trees, but as they had no time to waste on the sight of his eccentricities, they disappeared in different directions. Dusk was beginning to fall on the wood, and on the dead beggar as he lay with his two silent comrades looking towards the Grampians from the top of Huntley Hill. End of chapter 22《recording by Nan Dodge Flemington by Violet Jacob chapter 23 the Muir of Pert Callender watched his corporal riding away from the confines of the wood his eyes followed the horse as it disappeared into hollows and threaded its way among lumps of rock he stood for some time looking out over the landscape now growing cold with the loss of the sun his mind full of Flemington then he turned back with a sigh to retrace his way. His original intention in bringing Watty up the hill came back to him, and he remembered that he had yet to discover whether he could identify the red-bearded man. It was at this moment that the fusillade from his halting place burst upon him. He stopped, listening, then ran forward into the wood, the map from which he had been directing the corporal clutched in his hand. He had gone some distance with the soldier, so he only reached the place when the quick disaster was over to hear the hoofbeats of the escaping horses dying out as they galloped down Huntley Hill. The smoke of the firearms hung below the branches like a grey canopy, giving the unreality of a vision to the spectacle before him. He could not see the beggar's body, but the overturned cart was in full view a ridiculous object with its wooden wheels raised as though in protest to the sky. He looked in vain for a sign of his third man, and at the sight of the uniform upon the two dead figures lying on the ground he understood that he was alone. Of the three private soldiers who had followed him down Glen Esk there was not one left with him. Archie, the traitor, was gone, and only the red-bearded man remained. He could see him in the group that was watching James Logie as he captured the struggling dog. Callender ground his teeth. Then he dropped on one knee and contemplated the sight from behind the great circle of roots and earth that a fallen tree had torn from the sod. Of all men living, he was one of the last who might be called a coward, but neither was he one of those hotheads who will plunge to their own undoing and to that of other people into needless disaster. He would have gone grimly into the hornet's nest before him, pistol in hand, leaving heaven to take care of the result, had the smallest advantage to his king and country been attainable thereby. His own death or capture would do no more than prevent him from carrying news of what had happened to headquarters, and he decided, with the promptness hidden behind his taciturn demeanour, that his nearest duty was to identify James Logie if he were present. Callender's duty was the only thing that he always saw quickly. From his shelter he marked the two Jacobite officers, and as he knew Ferrier very well from description, he soon made out the man he wanted. James was changed since the time when he had first come across Archie's path. His clothes were worn and stained, and the life of wandering and concealment that he had led since he parted from the prince, had set its mark on him. He had slept in as many strange places of late as had the dead beggar at his feet. Anxious watching and lack of food and rest 
were leveling the outward man to something more primitive and haggard than the gallant-looking gentlemen of the days before Culloden. Yet there remained to him the atmosphere that could never be obliterated, the personality that he could never lose until the earth should lie on him. He was no better clothed than those who surrounded him, but his preeminence was plain. The watcher devoured him with his eyes as he turned from his comrades carrying the dog. As soon as he was out of sight, the rebels scattered quietly, and Callander crouched lower, praying fortune to prevent anyone from passing his retreat. None approached him, and he was left with the three dead men in possession of the wood. He rose and looked at his silent comrades. It would be useless to follow Logie, because, with so many of his companions dispersing at this moment about the fringes of the Muir of Pert, he could hardly hope to do so unobserved. There would be no chance of getting to close quarters with him, which was Callender's chief desire, for the mere suspicion of a hostile presence would only make James shift his hiding-place before the gathering troops could draw their cordon round him. He abandoned the idea with regret, telling himself that he must make a great effort to get to Brecon and to return with a mounted force in time to take action in the morning. The success of his ambush and his ignorance that he had been watched would keep Logie quiet for the night. He decided to take the only road that he knew, the one by which Flemington had left him. The upper one entangled itself in the muir and might lead him into some conclave of the enemy. He began to descend in the shadows of the coming darkness that was drawing itself like an insidious net over the spacious land. He had almost reached the road when a moving object not far from him made him stop. A man was hurrying up the hill some little way to his right, treading swiftly along, and though his head was turned from Callender, and he was not near enough for him to distinguish his features, the sling across his shoulder told him that it was Flemington. Callender stood still, staring after him. Archie's boldness took away his breath. Here he was, returning on his tracks, and if he kept his direction he would have to pass within a few hundred yards of the spot on which he knew that the companions he had left would be halted. Callender had pointed out the place to him as they approached the hill together. Archie took a wider sweep as he neared the wood, and the soldier, standing in the shadow of a rowan tree, whose berries were already beginning to colour for autumn, saw that he was making for the muir, and knew that the beggar was justified. One thing only could be bringing him back. He had come, as Waddy had predicted, to warn Logie. He had spoken wisdom, that dead vagabond, lying silent forever among the trees. He had assured him that Flemington would not suffer him to take Logie. He knew him, and he had laughed at the idea of his wounded arm turning him out of his road. "'It's no the like o' that gar's the like o' him greet,' he had said, and he was right. Callender, watching the definite course of the figure through the dusk, was sure that he was taking the simplest line to a retreat whose exact position he knew. He turned and followed, running from cover to cover, his former errand abandoned. It was strange that in spite of all, a vague gladness was in his heart, as he thought that Archie was not the soft creature that he had pretended to be. There were generous things in Callender. Then his generous impulse turned back on him in bitterness, for it occurred to him that Archie had been aware of what lay waiting for them, and had saved himself from possible accident in time. They went on till they reached the border of the Muir, Flemington going as unconcernedly as if he were walking in the streets of Brecon, though he kept wide of the spot on which he believed the riders to have disposed themselves for the night. There was no one who knew him in that part of the country and he wore no uniform to make him conspicuous in the eyes of any chance passer in this lonely neighborhood. As Callender emerged from the straggling growth at the Muir's edge, he saw him still in front going through the deep thickness of the heather. Callender wished that he knew how far the Muir extended, 
and exactly what lay on its farther side. His map was thrust into his coat, but it was now far too dark for him to make use of it. The tall figure was only just visible, and he redoubled his pace, gaining a little on it. A small stationary light shone ahead, evidently the window of some Muirland hovel. There was nothing so difficult to decide as the distance of a light at night, but he guessed that it was the goal towards which Archie was leading. He went forward till the young man's voice hailing someone and the sound of knocking made him stop and throw himself down in the heather. He thought he heard a door shut. When all had been quiet for a minute, he rose up and, approaching the house, took up his stand not a dozen yards from the walls. Perplexity came on him. He had been surprisingly successful in pursuing Flemington unnoticed as far as this hovel, but he had yet to find out who was inside it. Perhaps the person he had heard speaking was Logie, but equally perhaps not. There was no sound of voices within, though he heard movements. He dared not approach the uncurtained window to look in, for the person whose step he heard was evidently standing close to it. He would wait, listening for that person to move away, and then would try his luck. He had spent perhaps ten minutes thus occupied, when, without a warning sound, the door opened, and Archie stood on the threshold, as still as though he were made of marble. It was too dark for either man to see more than the other's blurred outline. Flemington looked out into the night. "'Come in, Callender," he called. "'You are the very man I want.' The soldier's astonishment was such that his feet seemed frozen to the ground. He did not stir. "'Come,' cried Archie. "'You have followed me so far that you surely will not turn back at the last step. I need you urgently, man. Come in.' He held the door open. Callender entered, pushing past him, and found himself in a low, small room, wretchedly furnished, with another at the back opening out of it. Both were empty, and the light he had seen was standing on the table. "'There is no one here,' he exclaimed. "'No,' said Flemington. "'Where is the man you were speaking to?' "'He is gone. The ill-mannered rogue would not wait to receive you.' "'It was that rebel. It was Captain Logie,' cried Callender. "'It was not Logie. You may take my word for that,' replied Archie. He sat down on the edge of the table and crossed his legs. "'Try again, Callender. he said lightly. Callender's lips were drawn into an even line, but they were shaking. The mortification of finding that Archie had been aware of his presence, had pursued his way unconcerned, knowing that he followed, had called him in as a man calls the serving man he has left outside, was hot in him. No wonder his own concealment had seemed so easy. "'You have sent him to warn Logie. That is what you have done,' he cried. "'You are a scoundrel. I know that.' He stepped up to him, and would have laid hold of his collar, but the sling stopped him. "'I have. Callender, you are a genius.' As the other stood before him, speechless, Flemington rose up. "'You have got to arrest me,' he said. "'That is why I called you in. I might have run out by the back of the house, like the man who is gone, who went with my message almost before the door was shut. Look, I have only one serviceable arm and no sword. I left it where I left my horse, and here is my pistol. I will lay it on the table so you will have no trouble in taking me prisoner. You have not had your stalking for nothing, after all, you mighty hunter before the Lord. You mean to give yourself up? You who have taken so much care to save yourself? I have meant to ever since I saw you under the rowan tree watching me flattened against the trunk like a squirrel. I would as soon be your prisoner as anyone else's. Sooner, I think. I cannot understand you, exclaimed Callender, taking possession of the weapon Archie had laid down. It is hard enough to understand oneself, but I do at last, said the other. Once I thought life easy, but mine has been mighty difficult lately. From here on it will be quite simple and there will not be much more of it, I fancy. You are right there, said Callender grimly. I can see straight before me now. I tell you, life has grown simple. 
You lied at the crossroads. I did. How you looked after me as I went. Well, I have done what I suppose no one has ever done before. I have threatened to report you for neglecting your duty. He threw back his head and laughed. And I am obliged to tell you to arrest me now. Oh, Calendar, who will correct your backslidings when there is an end of me? The other did not smile as he looked at Flemington's laughing eyes, soft and sparkling under the downward curve of his brows. Through his anger, the pity of it all was smiting him, though he was so little given to sentiment. Perhaps Archie's charm had told on him all the time they had been together, though he had never decided whether he liked him or not, and he looked so young when he laughed. "'What have you done?' he cried, pacing suddenly up and down the little room. "'You have run on destruction, Flemington. You have thrown your life away. Why have you done this? You! If a thing is worthless, there is nothing to do but throw it away.' Callender watched him with pain in his eyes. "'What made you suspect me?' asked Archie. You can tell me anything now. There is only one end to this business. It will be the making of you." "'Shaw!' exclaimed the other, turning away. "'Why did you follow me?' continued Archie. Callender was silent. "'Tell me this,' he said at last. "'What makes you give yourself up now without a struggle or a protest, when little more than two hours ago you ran from what you knew was to come, there at the foot of the hill?' Surely your friends would have spared you. Now it is I who do not understand you, said Archie. His companion stood in front of him, searching his face. Flemington, are you lying? On your soul, are you lying? Of what use are lies to me now, exclaimed Archie impatiently. Truth is a great luxury. Believe me, I enjoy it. You knew nothing of what was waiting for us at the top of Huntley Hill? Nothing, as I live, said Archie. The beggar betrayed you, said Callender. When you were gone, he told me that you were in Logie's pay, that you would warn him. He was right, Flemington. I am not in Logie's pay. I never was, broke in Archie. I did not know what to think, the soldier went on, but I took him up Huntley Hill with me, and when we had unsaddled and the men were lying under the trees, I sent the corporal to Brecon with the information. I went with him to the edge of the wood, and when I came back there was not a man left alive. Logie and Ferrier were there with a horde of their rebels. They had come to rescue the prisoner, and he was loose. And he was Ferrier's cousin, exclaimed Flemington. We were right. One of my men escaped, continued Callender, or I suppose so, for he was gone. The beggar and the other two were killed, and the horses had stampeded. So Waddy is dead, mused Flemington. Gad, what a voice has gone with him. They did not see me, but I watched them. I saw him, Logie. He went off quickly, and he took one of the beggar's dogs with him, snarling and struggling, with his head smothered in his coat. Then I went down the hill, meaning to make for Brecon, and I saw you coming back. I knew what you were about, thanks to that beggar. Neither spoke for a moment. Archie was still sitting on the table. He had been looking on the ground, and he raised his eyes to his companion's face. Something stirred in him, perhaps at the thought of how he stood with fate. He was not given to thinking about himself, but he might well do so now. Callender, he said, I dare say you don't like me. Then he broke off laughing. How absurd, he exclaimed. Of course you hate me. It is only right you should. But perhaps you will understand. I think you will, if you will listen. I was thrown against Logie, no matter how. But unknowing what he did, he put his safety in my hands. He did more. I had played upon his sympathy, and in the generosity of his heart he came to my help, as one true man might do to another. I was not a true man, but he did not know that. He knew nothing of me but that I stood in need, and he believed I was as honest as himself. He thought I was with his own cause. That was what I wished him to believe, had almost told him. Callender listened, the lines of his long face set. I had watched him and hunted him, continued Archie, 
and my information against him was already in the beggar's hands, on its way to its mark. I could not bring myself to do more against him then. What I did afterwards was done without mention of his name. You see, Callender, I have been true to nobody. He paused, waiting for comment, but the other made none. After that I went to Edinburgh, he continued, and he joined the prince. Then I went north with Cumberland. I was freed from my difficulty until they sent me here to take him. The duke gave me my orders himself, and I had to go. That ride with you was hell, Callender, and when we met the beggar today I had to make my choice. That was the turning point for me. I could not go on. He said it was not your wound that turned you aside. He was a shrewd rascal, said Flemington. I wish I could tell how he knew so much about me. It was your own tongue. Once you spent the night in a barn together when you were light-headed from a blow, and you spoke all night of Logie. You said enough to put him on your track. That is what he told me as we went up Huntley Hill. Archie shrugged his shoulders and rose up. Now what are you going to do, he said. I'm going to take you to Brecon. Come then, said Archie. We shall finish our journey together after all. It has been a hard day. I am glad it is over. They went out together. As Callender drew the door to behind them, Archie stood still. If I have dealt double with Logie, I will not do so with the king, said he. This is the way out of my difficulty. Do you understand me, Callender? The darkness hid the soldier's face. Perhaps of all the people who had played their part in the tangle of destiny, character, circumstance, or whatsoever influences had brought Flemington to the point at which he stood, he was the one who understood him best. End of chapter 23「Chapter Twenty Four of Flemington. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter Twenty Four The Vanity of Men. The last months had been a time of great anxiety to Lord Balnillo. In spite of his fine steering, and though he had escaped from molestation, he was not comfortable as he saw the imprisonments and confiscations that were going on, and the precariousness of all that had been secure disturbed him and made him restless. He was unsettled, too, by his long stay in Edinburgh, and he hankered afresh after the town life in which he had spent so many of his years. His trees and parks interested him still but he looked on them, wondering how long he would be allowed to keep them. He was lonely, and he missed James, whom he had not seen since long before Culloden, the star of whose destiny had led him out again into the world of chance. He had the most upsetting scheme under consideration that a man of his age can entertain. At sixty-four it is few people who think seriously of changing their state, Yet this was what David Balnillo had in mind, for he had found so many good reasons for offering his hand to Christian Flemington that he had decided at last to take that portentous step. The greatest of these was the effect that an alliance with the Whig lady would produce in the quarters, from which he feared trouble. His estate would be pretty safe if Madame Flemington reigned over it. It was pleasant to picture her magnificent presence at his table. Her company would rid country life of its dullness, and on the visits to Edinburgh, which he was sure she would wish to make, the new Lady Balnillo would turn their lodging into a bright spot in society. He smoothed his silk stockings as he imagined the stir that his belated romance would make. He would be the hero of it, and its heroine, besides being a safeguard to his property, would be a credit to himself. There were some obstacles to his plan, and one of them was Archie, but he believed that with a little diplomacy that particular difficulty might be overcome. He would attack that side of the business in a very straightforward manner. 
he would make Madam Flemington understand that he was large-minded enough to look upon the episode in which he had borne the part of victim in a reasonable yet airy spirit. In the game in which their political differences had brought them face to face, the honors had been with the young man. He would admit that with a smile and with the respect that one noble enemy accords to another. He would assure her that bygones should be bygones, and that when he claimed Archie as his grandson-in-law, he would do so without one grudging backward glance at the circumstances in which they had first met. His magnanimity seemed to him an almost touching thing, and he played with the idea of his own apposite grace, when, in some sly but genial moment, he would suggest that the portrait upstairs should be finished. What had given the final touch to his determination was a message that James had contrived to send him, which removed the last scruple from his heart. His brother's danger had weighed upon David, and it was not only its convenience to himself at this juncture which made him receive it with relief. Logie was leaving the country for Holland, and the next tidings of him would come from there, should he be lucky enough to reach its shores alive. Since the rescue of Gourlay, the neighborhood of the Muir of Pert, the last of his haunts in which Logie could trust himself, had become impossible for him, and he was now striving to get to a creek on the coast below Peterhead. It was some time since a roof had been over him, and the little cottage from which Flemington had dispatched his urgent warning stood empty. Its inmate had been his unsuspected connection with the world, since his time of wandering had begun, for though his fatal mistake in discovering this link in his chain of communication to Flemington had made him abjure its shelter, he had had no choice for some time between the Muir and any other place. The western end of the county swarmed with troops. Montrose was subdued. The passes of the Grampians were watched. There remained only this barren tract west of the river, and the warning brought to him from a nameless source had implored him to abandon it before the soldiery, which his informant assured him was collecting to sweep it from end to end, should range itself on its borders. Archie had withheld his name when he sent the dweller in the little hovel speeding into the night. He was certain that in making it known to James he would defeat his own ends, for Logie would scarcely be disposed to trust his good faith, and might well look on the message as a trick to drive him into some trap waiting for him between the Muir and the sea. James did not give his brother any details of his projected flight. He merely bade him an indefinite good-bye. The game was up, even he was obliged to admit that, and Ferrier, whose ardent spirit had been one with his own since the beginning of all things, was already making for a fishing village, from which he hoped to be smuggled out upon the high seas. Nothing further could be gained in Angus for the Stuart cause. The friends had spent themselves since April in their endeavors to resuscitate the feeling in the country, but there was no more money to be raised, no more men to be collected. They told themselves that all they could do now was to wait in the hope of a day when their services might be needed again. That day would find them both ready if they were above ground. David knew that, had James been in Scotland, he would not have dared to think of bringing Christian Flemington to Balnillo. He had a feeling of adventure when he started from his own door for Ardguys. The slight awe with which Christian still inspired him, even when she was most gracious, was beginning to foreshadow itself, and he knew that his bones would be mighty stiff on the morrow. There was no riding of the circuit now to keep him in practice in the saddle but he was not going to give way to silly apprehensions unsuited to his age and position. He would give himself every chance in the way of effect. The servant who rode after him carried a handsome riding suit for his master to don at Forfar before making the last stage of his road. It grieved Balnillo to think how much of the elegance of his well-turned legs must be unrevealed by his high boots. He was a personable old gentleman, and his grey cob was worthy of carrying an eligible wooer. 
He reached Ardguys and dismounted under its walls on the following afternoon. He had sent no word in front of him. Christian rose when he was ushered into her presence and laid down the book in her hand, surprised. "'You are as unexpected as an earthquake!' she exclaimed, as she saw who was her visitor. "'But not as unwelcome,' said David. "'Far from it. Sit down, my lord. I had begun to forget that civilization existed, and now I am reminded of it.' He bowed, delighted. A few messages and compliments, a letter or two dispatched by hand, had been their only communications since the judge left Edinburgh and his spirits rose as he found that she seemed really pleased to see him. "'And what has brought you?' asked Christian, settling herself with the luxurious deliberation of a cat into the large chair from which she had risen. "'Something good, certainly.' "'A simple desire to see you, ma'am. Could anything be better?' It was an excellent opening, but he had never, even in his youth, been a man who ran full tilt upon anything. He had scarcely ever before made so direct a speech. She smiled, amused. There had been plenty of time for thought in her solitude. But though she had thought a good deal about him, she had not a suspicion of his errand. She saw people purely in relation to the uses she had for them, and officially she had pronounced him harmless to the party in whose interest she had kept him at her side. The circumstances were not those which further sentiment. "'I have spent this quiet time in remembering your kindnesses to me,' he began, inspired by her smile. "'You call it a quiet time?' she interrupted. "'I had not looked on it in that way. Quiet for us, perhaps, but not for the country.' "'True, true,' said he, in the faraway tone in which some people seek to let unprofitable subjects melt." Now that the active part of the rebellion had become history, she had no hesitation in speaking out from her solid place on the winning side. "'This wretched struggle is over, and we may be plain with one another, Lord Balnillo,' she continued. "'You, at least, have had much to alarm you.' "'I have been a peaceful servant of law and order all my life,' said he, "'and as such I have conceived it my place to stand aloof.' It has been my duty to restrain violence of all kinds. But you have not restrained your belongings, she observed boldly. He was so much taken aback that he said nothing. Well, my lord, it is one of my regrets that I have never seen Captain Logie. At least you have to be proud of a gallant man, she went on, with the same impulse that makes all humanity set a fallen child upon its legs but Balnillo had a genius for scrambling to his feet. "'My brother has left the country in safety,' he rejoined, with one of those random flashes of sharpness that had stood him in such good stead. His cunning was his guardian angel, for he did not know what she knew, namely, that Archie had left Fort Augustus in pursuit of James. "'Indeed,' she said, silenced. She was terribly disappointed, but she hid her feelings in barefaced composure. The judge drew his chair closer. Here was another opening, and his very nervousness pushed him towards it. Ma'am, he began, clearing his throat, I shall not despair of presenting James to you, when the country is settled, if, in short, I imagine that Captain Logie will hardly trust himself in Scotland, either in my lifetime or in yours. We are old, you and I, she added, the bitterness of her disappointment surging through her words. She watched him to see whether this barbed truth pierced him. It pierced herself as she hurled it. Maybe, said he, but age has not kept me from the business I have come upon. I have come to put a very particular matter before you. She was still unsuspicious, but she grew impatient. He had wearied her often in Edinburgh with tedious histories of himself, and she had endured them then for reasons of policy, but she felt no need of doing so here. It was borne in upon her, as it has been borne in upon many of us, that a person who is acceptable in town may be unendurable in the country. She had not thought of that as she welcomed him. Ma'am, he went on, intent on nothing but his affair, 
I may surprise you. I trust I shall not offend you. At least you will approve the feelings of devotion, of respect, of admiration which have brought me here. I have an ancient name. I have sufficient means. I am not ill-looking, I believe. Are you making me a proposal, my lord? She spoke with an accent of derision. The sting of it was sharp in her tone. There is no place for ridicule, ma'am. I see nothing unsuitable in my great regard for you. He spoke with real dignity. She had not suspected him of having any, personally, and she had forgotten that an inherited stock of it was behind him. The rebuke astonished her so much that she scarcely knew what reply to make. "'As I said, I believe I am not ill-looking,' he repeated, with an air that lost him his advantage. "'I can offer you such a position as you have a right to expect. "'You also offer me a brother-in-law whose destination may be the scaffold,' she said brutally. "'Do not forget that.' This was not to be denied, and for a moment he was put out. But it was on these occasions that he shone. "'Let us dismiss family matters from our minds and think only of ourselves,' said he. "'My brother is an outlaw, and as such is unacceptable to you, and your grandson has every reason to be ashamed to meet me. We can set these disadvantages one against the other and agree to ignore them.' "'I am not disposed to ignore Archie,' said she. "'Well, ma'am, neither am I. I hope I am a large-minded man.' Indeed, no one can sit on the bench for the time that I have sat on it and not realize the frailty of all creatures. My lord, began Christian, but it is something to have learned continuance of speech professionally, and Balnillo was launched. Also his own magnanimous attitude had taken his fancy. I will remember nothing against him, said he. I will forget his treatment of my hospitality and the discreditable uses to which he put my roof. Sir, broke in Christian, I will remember that, according to his lights, he was in the exercise of his duty. Whatsoever may be my opinion of the profession to which he was compelled, I will thrust it behind me with the things best forgotten. That is enough, Lord Balnillo, cried Madam Flemington, rising. Sit, madam, sit. Do not disturb yourself. Understand me that I will allow every leniency. I will make every excuse. I will dwell not on the fact that he was a spy, but on his enviable relationship to yourself. She stood in the middle of the room, threatening him with her eyes. Some people tremble when roused to the pitch of anger that she had reached. Some gesticulate. Christian was still. He had risen, too. If you suppose that I could connect myself with a disloyal house, you are much mistaken, she said, controlling herself with an effort. I have no quarrel with your name, Lord Balnillo. It is old enough. My quarrel is with the treason in which it has been dipped. But I am very well content with my own. Since I have borne it, I have kept it clean from any taint of rebellion. But I have been a peaceful man, he protested, as I told you, the law has been my profession. I have raised a hand against no one. Do you think I do not know you? exclaimed she. Do you suppose that my ears were shut in the winter, and that I heard nothing in all the months I spent in Edinburgh? What of that, Lord Balnillo? You made no objection to me then, ma'am. I was made happy by being of service to you. She laughed scornfully. Let us be done with this, she said. You have offered yourself to me, and I refuse the offer. I will add my thanks. The last words were a masterpiece of insolent civility. A gilt-framed glass hung on the wall, one of the possessions that she had brought with her from France. David suddenly caught sight of his own head reflected in it above the lace cravat for which he had paid so much. The spectacle gathered up his recollections and his present mortification infused them into one stab of hurt vanity. "'I see that you can make no further use of me,' he said. "'None.' He walked out of the room. At the door he turned and bowed. "'If you will allow me, I will call for my horse myself,' said he. He went out of the house, and she stood where she was, 
thinking of what he had told her about his brother. She had set her heart upon Archie's success in taking Logie, and now the man had left the country, and his chance was gone. The proposal to which she had just listened did not matter to her one way or the other, though he had offended her by the attitude he took up when making it. He was unimportant. It was of Archie that she thought, as she watched the judge and his servant ride away between the ash-trees. They were crossing the Kilpie Burn when her maid came in, bringing a letter. The writing on it was strange to Christian. "'Who has brought this?' she asked, as she opened it. "'Just a collant,' replied the girl. She read the letter, which was short. It was signed R. Callender, Captain, and was written at Archie Flemington's request to tell her that he was under arrest at Brecon on a charge of conspiring with the king's enemies. The writer added a sentence, unknown, as he explained, to Flemington. "'The matter is serious,' he wrote. "'The Duke of Cumberland is still in Edinburgh. It might be well if you could see him. Make no delay as we await his orders.' She stood, turning cold, her eyes fixed on the maid. "'Ah, losh mem,' whimpered Mysie, approaching her with her hands raised. Madam Flemington felt as though her brain refused to work. There seemed to be nothing to drive it forward. The world stood still. The walls, an imprisoning horror, shut her in from all movement, all action, when action was needed. She had never felt Ardguys to be so desperately far from the reach of humanity, herself so much cut off from it as now. And yet she must act. Her nearest channel of communication was the judge riding away. Fool! she cried, seizing Mysie. Run! Run! Send the boy after Lord Balnillo. Tell him to run. The maid hesitated, staring at the pallor of her mistress's face. Ah, but Mem, sit you down, she wailed. Christian thrust her from her path as though she had been a piece of furniture and swept into the hall. A barefooted youth was outside by the door. He stared at her as Mysie had done. She took him by the shoulder. Run, go instantly after those horses. That is Lord Balnillo, she cried, pointing to the riders who were mounting the rise beyond the burn. Tell him to return at once. Tell him he must come back. He shook off her grip and ran. He was a corner boy from Brecon, and he had a taste for sensation. Madame Flemington went back into her room. Mysie followed her, whimpering still, and she pushed her outside and sank down in her large chair. She could not watch the window for fear of going mad. She sat still and steady, until she heard the thud of bare feet on the stone steps, and then she hurried out. "'He tellt me he wotn't abide,' said the corner boy, breathlessly. "'He was very well obliged to ye, but he bade me say, but he wotn't abide.' Christian left him and shut herself into the room, alone. Callender's bald lines had overpowered her completely, leaving no place in her brain for anything else. But now she saw her message from Lord Balnillo's point of view, and anger and contempt flamed up again, even in the midst of her trouble. "'The vanity of men! Ah, oh, God, the vanity of men!' she cried, throwing out her hands, as though to put the whole race of them from her. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of Flemington this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Flemington by Violet Jacob. Chapter 25. A Royal Duke. The Duke of Cumberland was at Holyrood House. He had come down from the north by way of Stirling, and having spent some days in Edinburgh, he was making his final arrangements to set out for England. He was returning in the enviable character of conquering hero, and he knew that a great reception awaited him in London, where every preparation was being made to do him honour. He was thinking of these things as he sat in one of the grim rooms of the ancient palace. There was not much luxury here, and looking across the table at which he sat, and out of the window, 
he could see the dirty roofs of the cannon gate, a very different prospect from the one that would soon meet his eyes. He was sick of Scotland. Papers were littered on the table, and his secretary had just carried away a bundle with him. He was alone because he expected a lady to whom he had promised an audience, but he was not awaiting her with the feelings that he generally brought to such occasions. Cumberland had received the visits of many women alone since leaving England, but his guests were younger than the one whose approach he could now hear in the anteroom outside. He drew his brows together, for he expected no profit and some annoyance from the interview. He arose as she was ushered in and went to the open fireplace, where he stood awaiting her, drawn up to his full height, which was not great. The huge iron dogs behind him and the high mantelpiece above his head dwarfed him with their large lines. He was not an ill-looking young man, though his hair, pulled back and tied after the fashion of the day, showed off the receding contours that fell away from his temples, and made his blue eyes look more prominent than they were. He moved forward clumsily as Christian curtsied. "'Come in, madam, come in, be seated. I have a few minutes only to give you,' he said, pointing to a chair on the farther side of the table. She sat down opposite to him. "'I had the honour of being presented to your royal highness last year,' she said. "'I remember you well, ma'am,' replied he shortly. "'It is in the hope of being remembered that I have come,' said she. "'It is to ask you, sir, to remember the services of my house to yours. "'I remember them, ma'am. I forget nothing.' "'I'm asking you, in remembering, to forget one thing,' said she. "'I shall not waste your Royal Highness's time and mine in beating about bushes. "'I have travelled here from my home without resting, and it is not for me to delay now.' He took up a pen that lay beside him, and put the quill between his teeth. "'Your Royal Highness knows why I have come,' continued she, her eyes falling from his own, and fixing themselves on the pen in his mouth." He removed it with his fat hand and tossed it aside. "'There is absolute proof against Flemington,' said he. "'He accuses himself. I presume you know that.' "'I do. This man, Captain Logie, has some strange attraction for him that I cannot understand, and did him some kindness that seems to have turned his head. His regard for him was a purely personal one. It was personal friendship that led him to—to— to to the madness he has wrought. His hands are clean of conspiracy. I have come all this way to assure your highness of that. It is possible, said Cumberland. The result is the same. We have lost the man whose existence above ground is a danger to the kingdom. I have come to ask you to take that difference of motive into consideration, she went on. Were the faintest shadow of conspiracy proved, I should not dare to approach you. My request should not pass my lips. I have been in correspondence with him during the whole of the campaign, and I know that he served the king loyally. I beg your highness to remember that now. I speak of his motive because I know it. You are fortunate, then, he interrupted. Captain Callender, to whom he gave himself up, wrote me two letters at his request, one in which he announced his arrest, and one which I received as I entered my coach to leave my door. Archie knows what is before him, she added. He has no hope of life and no knowledge of my action in coming to your highness. But he wished me to know the truth, that he had conspired with no one. He is ready to suffer for what he has done, but he will not have me ashamed of him. Look, sir. She pushed the letter over to him. His motives may go hang, madam, said Cumberland. Your highness, if you have any regard for us who have served you, read this. He rose and went back to the fireplace. "'There is no need, madam. I am not interested in the correspondence of others.' He was becoming impatient. He had spent enough time on this lady. She was not young enough to give him any desire to detain her. She was an uncommon-looking woman, certainly, but at her age that fact could matter to nobody. He wondered casually whether the old stories about her and Charles Edward's father were true. Women struck him only in one light. "'You will not read this, your royal highness,' said Christian, with a little tremor of voice. "'No, ma'am. 
I may tell you that my decision has not altered. The case is not one that admits of any question. Your Highness, said Christian, rising, I have never made an abject appeal to any one yet, and even now, though I make it to the son of my king, I can hardly bring myself to utter it. I deplore my, my boy's action from the bottom of my soul. I sent him from me. I parted from him nearly a year ago because of this man Logie. He faced round upon her and put his hands behind his back. What? he exclaimed. You knew of this? You have been keeping this affair secret between you? He went to Montrose on the track of Logie in November, said she. He was sent there to watch his movements before Prince Charles marched to England, and he did so well that he contrived to settle himself under Lord Balnillo's roof. In three days he returned to me. He had reported on Logie's movements. I know that. Your Highness's agents can produce his report. But he returned to my house to tell me that, for some fool's reason, some private question of sentiment, he would follow Logie no longer. I will not go man-hunting after Logie. Those were his words. Madam, began Cumberland. She put out her hand, and her gesture seemed to reverse their positions. I told him to go. I told him that I would sooner see him dead than that he should side with the Stuarts. He answered me that he could have no part with rebels, and that his act concerned Logie alone. Then he left me, and on his way to Brecon he received orders to go to the government ship in Montrose Harbour. Then the ship was attacked and taken. It was Flemington's friend Logie who was at the bottom of that business, said Cumberland. He met Logie, and they fought, said Madame Flemington. I know none of the details, but I know that they fought. Then he went to Edinburgh. It is time that we finished with this, exclaimed Cumberland. No good is served by it. I am near the end, your highness, said Christian, and then paused, unnerved by the too great suggestiveness of her words. These things are no concern of mine, he observed in the pause. His movements do not matter, and I may tell you, ma'am, that my leisure is not unlimited. It was nearing the close of the afternoon, and the sun stood like a red ball over the mists of the Edinburgh smoke. Cumberland's business was over for the day, and he was looking forward to dining that evening with a carefully chosen handful of friends, male and female. Her nerve was giving way against the stubborn detachment of the man. She felt herself helpless, and her force ineffective. Life was breaking up round her. The last man she had confronted had spurned her in the end, through a mistake, it was true, but the opportunity had been given him by her own loss of grip in the bewilderment of a crisis. This one was spurning her too, but she went on. He performed his work faithfully from that day forward, as your Royal Highness knew, when you took him to the North. His services are better known to you, sir, than to any one else. He gave himself up to Captain Callender as the last proof that he could take no part with the rebels. He threw away his life. That, at least, is true, said the Duke, with a sneer. He was becoming exasperated, and the emphasis which she put on the word that brought the slow blood to her face. She looked at him as though she saw him across some mud-befouled stream. Even now her pride rose above the despair in her heart. He was not sensitive, but her expression stung him. "'I am accustomed to truth,' she replied. He turned his back. There was a silence. "'I came to ask for Archie's life,' she said in a toneless, steady voice. "'But I will go, asking nothing. Your Royal Highness has nothing to give that he or I would stoop to take at your hands.' He stood doggedly without turning, and he did not move until the sound of her sweeping skirts had died away in the anteroom. Then he went out, a short, stoutish figure passing along the dusty corridors of Holyrood, and entered a room from which came the ring of men's voices. A party of officers in uniform got up as he came in. Some were playing cards. He went up to one of the players and took those he held from between his fingers. "'Give me your hand, Walden,' said he, "'and for God's sake get us a bottle of wine. "'Damn me, but I hate old women. "'They should have their tongues cut out.'" End of chapter 25